welcome back to Switched to Linux. So today what we're going to do is we're going to continue a video session that I did in December. I forgot all about it, um, but I had a few ideas and I thought some of these seem fairly familiar. So I went back and I looked and um, I did actually do a video saying, hey, eventually I'm going to do another one. So we're going to continue that. So this is top five privacy protecting tools you can use. Now, the previous video looked on things you could do on your computer specifically. Here, we are going to conclude the services that are out there. So the first one was the things you can do at your computer. The second are those other items across the Internet. And the kitty wants to come in and say hello. Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing? All right. So, kitty, come up. All right. So, uh, let's go ahead and dive into these. And uh, what we're going to do is, uh, first, we're going to start off by looking at VPNs. So, uh, VPNs, and the reason this is number five, kitty is not cooperating. <laughs> he cannot go on the desk right now. I don't have a firm phone. Okay, so the reason I'm putting this at number five is I am not in any way an advocate for VPNs as a lot of people are advocating for VPNs, okay? And there's some very good reason why that is the case. Um, the first thing is it's become an over-marketed target that we are being told over and over this is a silver bullet for your privacy, and it is not. All you're doing is porting all of the stuff from your ISP over to the VPN company. And there are a lot of VPN companies that are coming up and attempting to capitalize on all this VPN marketing to collect your data. And you could get into a situation where it's way, 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 way worse. So I did a, a couple part series on VPNs in more detail a while ago. I'll go ahead and put that up there in the video. Um, but ultimately, why, like, what is the purpose of a VPN? Well, the original purpose of a VPN is to allow a person into a network when you're not in there. So I first encountered VPNs as a college professor, you know, you're uh, working as a, as a professor or whatever at, at a university, maybe you're a businessman at some business, and you need to access things that are on the server. Well, it's irresponsible to point all of that important stuff to a public-facing internet. Um, yeah, that's how hacks happen. And so the concept of a VPN allowed you to get in through a very secure tunnel. Once you're into that tunnel, now you can access everything as if you were in that region. So the reason you had an, a, uh, you had these is you had this head office where your main infrastructure happens to be. And then over the internet, you might have a regional office, which would get a hard line into a direct line in. Um, to head offices, you know, regional offices, head offices. Well, what would happen is a remote internet user could then bridge into the VPN at the head office and then they could access any of the network servers anywhere through the internet. Now, the way that this worked is it produced a fully encrypted tunnel. That's how a VPN, it's like all of the functionality we hear about for a VPN is all the side effects as it were. And so basically it does give you indeed a secure connection. It does encrypt the traffic. The problem is it encrypts the traffic and opens it right back up in the company. Many companies say they don't have logs. Well, anybody can type a website that says, I don't type logs. A lot of these companies that have said, we don't keep logs have been outed as actually keeping logs. So the VPN, it's not that you shouldn't use one. It's that the VPN is not the silver bullet. There are times you want to use it. Um, number one time is if you are a person who travels a lot, maybe you work at coffee shops a lot, you want to be able to have a VPN to encrypt your data at the coffee shop. Absolutely, because it prevents other people at the coffee shop from snooping on what you're doing if they're sitting over there with Wireshark on, you know, on a little laptop in the corner, they can monitor everybody on the network. A VPN will get around that. Um, if you travel internationally, you use a VPN to get back into your home country to use services that you have legally obtained in that country. 
Um, you might use it if you are developing products and services and things and you need to do different IP checks. You might need it if you need to adjust your city from time to time. There are absolutely good legitimate reasons to use a VPN. Um, I personally set up a VPN in my house to get me into my home network when I'm out and about in the world. So I can still access everything on my home network through a VPN managed here. So those are kind of all those things to think about. VPN is indeed a good way to keep some things private, but it's not a silver bullet. And I don't like how much it has been pushed as a silver bullet. And then we're starting to see way too much affiliate marketing. Not that affiliate marketing is all that bad. And eventually I will probably have some VPN affiliate marketing on the site. As of this recording, I don't. But the problem is when you get affiliate marketing, you end up with the byproduct of affiliate marketing is fluff reviews. And I want to counteract some of that and dispel some of that. And there are going to be some legitimate reasons for a VPN that I have not covered here. Um, but that's just kind of the, the first place to look at. Um, and so with that VPN, there's my number five. Number four, DNS services. So there's been all this talk about 1.1.1.1 this week. There's, of course, Google has 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. uh, don't use 9.9.9.9. .9 That's controlled by the UK uh, police or whatever I, I have heard. Um, this is one option, and I'm going to do a, a more complete video of this another time, probably, possibly tomorrow. Um, but regardless, uh, DNS services, what you have with a DNS service is this is a means that you can, uh, basically the, the DNS service allows the domain names we can remember to translate into the numbers that we couldn't possibly remember because there's way too many of them. Um, and so the DNS service allows, it allows the translation across the different runs. This is where I talk a lot about the host file, especially on the previous video. The host file locally adjusts the DNS, okay? By default, if you haven't changed it, if whoever your ISP is, you're using their DNS services. Well, whatever DNS services could in, in theory spy on everything that you're doing. So the Cloudflare 1.1.1.1 comes out, the Google 8.8.8.8, etc. These will allow an extra pass through where the ISP will see you're connecting over there, but they don't see all of the sites are hitting because the local DNS is taking care of that. Some DNS uh, services will act as ad blockers or spam blockers or things like that. Um, other ones will just, uh, like this Cloudflare one, is supposedly is going to start blocking out more of what they know as malicious sites. So there's a lot of things that you can do with that. One of the chief things is once you get the, the DNS over HTTPS or called DOH, okay, um, well, D-O-H, um, DNS uh, over HTTPS, in theory, that's going to counteract this reversal of the privacy effects as long as whoever controls the DNS is also reputable. That's the same exact problem as the VPN. You have to trust the person at the other end of that. Cloudflare says they do not uh, write to disk any requests and any data that's collected in any way, shape, or form is wiped within 24 hours. That's what they're saying. Um, and so then I would probably be more inclined to use a service like that than I would be too inclined to use a VPN. But um, again, everything takes a little bit of its own research. But the things that are better to focus on rather than just this and other things that we can do ourselves is you can do things uh, like this guy here, which is your Pi Hole. So Pi Hole is a Raspberry Pi device. It's a Raspberry Pi application where you can run this on a Raspberry Pi, which you could run on a Pi Zero, uh, for example. And what this will do is this will act as a local DNS. It basically is a supplement to your router. Now, I probably wouldn't use this because I'm running a PFSense router and my PFSense router can do a lot of things Pi Hole can do. But if you don't have PFSense, if you're just using a commercial router, you might invest in a Raspberry Pi and set up Pi Hole. What you will be enabled to do here is you can set this up to use 
your 1.1.1.1 if you want as your primary, but then what happens is DNS cascades. Wherever you get closer to your local device will override anything further out. Okay, so if I were to block, for example, Facebook on this computer that I'm recording this on, I couldn't get on Facebook no matter what DNS has it. Okay, um, but if I'm if I'm trying to uh, if I don't block Facebook here and I want to block it on the next level up, so if I block Facebook on my router, then any device connected to my router now can't access Facebook. All right, so what Pi-hole is going to do is this is a system that actually keeps itself fairly up to date. It always tracks, um, it, it always tra tracks things like like trackers, malware, uh, advertising type stuff, um, hundred thousand different ad serving domains, um, blocks on any type of device. So basically, what you do is you set this up. You connect this to your router and then you use this as a local DNS server. So then the Raspberry Pi is going to control the internet. That's going to go out to your either your 1.1.1.1 or your default ISP uh, DNS if you want it to. And then you're going to come back into this and then that's going to filter out anything on top of that and then pass it through the router which is going to pass it everywhere in your network. So if you don't have the ability to fully customize your router, you probably want to investigate and look up Pi-hole. And I don't have any videos on this yet. Um, maybe I will eventually. And I'll also mention, I don't know as much about this one. I couldn't find a, a full web page, but uh, Quidsup, um, who knows a lot about this stuff, has another one of these called No Track. It's essentially kind of like Pi-hole. Um, also runs on a Raspberry Pi. So I just wanted to throw that one in there because he's got great content and I thought that'd be a ni nice little plug uh, to throw in there. So look at your DNS servers as a... Um, uh, as a next step. Number three, I included this in the original list and I probably should not have. I should have included uh, things like, you know, Tor focused brow or Tor focused operating systems on the original list in place of this. But regardless, we're going to go ahead and include it here because I am talking about online services. Um, use a search engine that does not, uh, track data, use basically privacy centric um, search uh, search engines. So my favorite ones here are start page is the one that I use by default. Of course, they're the same company behind IX quick. If IX quick still exists, you'll notice that's, you know, basically retracts the same thing. Um, so the what start page is, is, is start page gives you Google results without Google's bias and without Google's tracking. And those are the important things. The, the two things there, number one, Google will track your IP address based on your search. So you'll do search. It keeps logs of all this stuff as a means to better serve ads across the network. When it sees your IP address, it has an algorithm to determine the things you've looked at. The second thing though, and, and probably the biggest issue is that with this or any other algorithm driven site is it tends to narrow your frame of mind rather than expanding your frame of mind because it starts to learn the types of things you look at and read and it starts to feed back to you the same information you've always keep looking at. And so what it does is it narrows your point of view and that's a problem. Um, so what start page will do is it will give you unbiased Google results. It strips the IP address, does the Google search, gives you data independent of your IP address and independent of, of tracking anything. So start page is my preferred one. The other one that is also up there uh, as far as the best ones are DuckDuckGo. I, the only reason I don't use this is I just don't like the theming. Um, very, very small and petty. But at the same token, um, that's, you know, it, it means a lot. Uh, so this in this search engine is more independent. When I've done tests with it, of course, start page and Google return similar results differed only in your uh, in your IP bias. DuckDuckGo tends to uh, return searches more like Bing, although to my knowledge, they're not in any way affiliated. Um, so if you do a search for something on DuckDuckGo, you get this. I, I got to say, I'm liking their theming a whole lot better. This is infinitely easier to use than it used to be. So I can say that, that my concerns are probably no longer valid and probably I'm just going to keep using start page because of habit. <laughs> so either one of these, if like, if you're using Google, stop using Google. Uh, if you're using Yahoo, 
get your head checked. I don't know. No, stop using Yahoo. Um, all these types of things. Um, but if you're not using one of these two, either StartPage or DuckDuckGo, start using these as your default. They're both good. Um, they're and they're both privacy uh, privacy centric. Um, DuckDuckGo is an American company, and StartPage I believe is from Netherlands. Um, I might be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure it's Netherlands. So if that carries any significance or weight with it, um, that is certainly your um, your number three item. Number two is your email. More and more and more often, our emails, we're relying on free services. Our emails are getting scanned. In fact, just today, Oath, if you don't remember Oath, it is the combination of what happened when Verizon, AOL, and Yahoo all merged together to form the abomination that is Oath. They have just today released new terms and conditions in which I will cover in a very soon upcoming episode, probably tomorrow morning, if you're watching this on the original Monday it's released. And um, Oath released a new update to their terms and conditions that literally says, we will scan your pictures, your content, every email you send, every email you receive, even your banking stuff. They even have a separate section for how we're going to treat your banking stuff for the purpose of selling you ads. Google claims they don't do that anymore. They were caught doing that at one point in time. Um, so basically, and, and Bing, pfft, yeah, well, Outlook, I guess it is. Microsoft, yeah, they so love collecting data. I have no idea. Um, so you want to consider different email options. If you only need one or two email addresses, um, probably the simplest, best solution right now is ProtonMail. Uh, ProtonMail is based out of Switzerland. It is end-to-end -end encrypted. They do not even have encryption keys. So, you know, it's probably illegal in Russia. Um, but hey, we're not in Russia, so that's all good. Um, with the free account, um, you pretty much you only have web access. Um, I think you might, I couldn't find anything to the contrary. I think you also can access this with the apps. When I first got a ProtonMail account, um, the apps were only, uh, you could still only use the apps with a donation or, or, um, or with a paid account. I think those are now free and available so you can use it. I found that the mobile version on the web browser or the desktop web browser, it's fine if you just need a simple email system. You're limited to 150 emails per day, 500 megabytes of storage, and limited support. Um, it's a very easy to use interface though. There's, uh, you can add a alternative recovery email, but you don't have to. This is one of the things I liked about it is it needed less information than anyone else. It's like, I just want to get an email address. I don't want to connect it to my cell phone. And what about people who don't have text messaging for crying out loud? So ProtonMail is an excellent service. Um, if you need a little bit more than that um, for $4 a month, of course, you can come down here and change the currency. Um, I switched this to U.S. currency. It defaults to euros. Um, for $4 a month, and I think you can, I think it's like $5 a month if you buy it monthly or $48 a year if you buy a year out in advance. So basically a dollar a month if you, a uh, dollar a month savings if you buy it all at, all at once. Uh, so for $4 a month, um, you have thousand messages a day, five gigabytes of storage, and then there's all this typical stuff you recall in a basic webmail client custom filters, folders. Um, you can also send encrypted messages to external recipients. You can use your own domain name, um, which is significant. You can have up to five email address, uh, email aliases, excuse me, on this. And you have priority customer support. Uh, this also allows you, because a lot of people said, well, I can't use my other clients. There is actually an a application for that. Uh, this is a... Um, this is a separate, uh, I think it's a separate application. I didn't look much into it. Uh, but this will allow you to interface it. The Mac and the Windows version is already out. The Linux client, they say early 2018. It is early 2018, so I'm guessing this might be available. Um, I don't know. Let's actually go to check out their website. Um, uh, so what this is going to allow you to do is, um, let's see, install the bridge. Okay, so it's it's available for Linux now. Okay, uh, okay, I guess not. It still says coming soon. 
Um, so what this is going to allow you to do is it will uh, basically allow a relay. So it will get the messages and all that and it is encrypted. And then this is going to relay the information into your uh, into your client of choice, you know, whether you're using Outlook, uh, Evolution, um, Thunderbird, things like that. So you do have the option that is only available if you are on the paid option. And then, of course, there's the visionary stuff, which I didn't look into all that, but you can kind of see 50 email aliases, 20 gigabytes of storage, 10 different domains. So, you know, this is actually good for uh, if you're an enterprise or something, you can do this one here. Um, and they do have a VPN. Speaking of VPNs earlier, this also does include access um, for um, uh, they do the Proton Mail Group does have Proton VPN, so this one here does include access to that as well. So um, that is you know that is some email stuff. That's if you just need a couple email addresses. What I personally do is I host all my email addresses on. Uh, on servers. So either a VPS, I have a VPS, um, so a VPS is great for this, or a, um, um, just, you can do a shared server. It's probably better to do a VPS because you have more granular control over your IP address that way. Um, if you're on a shared server, some other guy gets on there and starts spamming stuff, you might get blacklisted. If you're on a VPS, chances are that won't happen. Um, and you can, if you have a VPS, you can actually get yourself removed from blacklists fairly easy. Um, but what I do is I just set up a cPanel, and we're going to come back to cPanel on my number one point as well. Um, there's two different companies that I would recommend using. Uh, I use these because they are not in any way associated with EIG or with GoDaddy. You kind of want to avoid any EIG company, uh, in, uh, hosting company uh, that is Endurance International Group. They have horrible service. Um, they do not support SSLs. They try and upsell a lot of things and you don't want to work with those companies. I've been doing this work for a long time. Trust me. They get a hold of you. Once they get a hold of a company, it's over. <laughs> um, also GoDaddy, horrible. Don't use GoDaddy unless you absolutely have to. Um, the companies that I recommend, um, A2 Hosting I've done work with um, and a SiteGround I've done work with at the time recording this video. I do not have any affiliate links. I probably will have affiliate links for these soon. I am working on an affiliate section of my site uh, for products that I would actually use. The One of the things that you want to look for um, uh, that when you're looking at these types of, of services is, you know, what is your cost? Like almost every company will give you a discounted rate to start, but then it's a little bit more expensive. So you see that, that here with their light, it's actually only like eight bucks a month. Usually the way a two hosting works is whatever this discount price is, you can buy that much per year up front and then uh, what they have is, uh, with their pricing structure, is the more upfront you buy, the cheaper it happens to be. And so this is this is good. The things you want to look for is you want to look for, if you're limited on any emails, you probably shouldn't be. Um, ask yourself how many domain names you need. So like this basic is only a single domain name. If that's good for you, that's not too bad of a price. Um, what you want to see is free SSL and um, uh, SSL, SSD, whatever. Uh, but SSL, these are encrypting. These are using the Let's Encrypt system. It sets up as an auto encrypt. Um, you do want the reason you want this is for your email. You want to be able to connect to your system with SSL, um, and also for a number one point, I'm going to talk to you. You want an SSL for that. An EIG group, like I mentioned. They don't at this time, unless something has changed, support Let's Encrypt SSLs, at least not easily. It's a, and they're going to try and upsell you theirs for 50 bucks a year or more. And so what you want to do is you want something that supports that Let's Encrypt. Both uh, SiteGround and A2 uh, hosting will, um, uh, I can't go down, hover down there. You can see that are on the left column, second from the bottom, free SSLs. This way you can encrypt everything into there. This is these are the shared systems. If you have the extra money, you might want to go with the VPS. Um, regardless, hosting your own email is very easy. It's very good. It's not the absolute most end-to-end -end encrypted secure, but email's not supposed to be a big secure platform. 
Um, the importance of this is that nobody is snooping on your content. Nobody's reading your emails. Of course, if I email somebody at AOL, Verizon, or Yahoo, well, who the recipient of that email is getting spied on. And yes, by proxy, my email is getting spied on if I email for someone from those services. But my personal email is not being harvested and targeted toward me because I'm not using those services. So use your own email, whether you're using, um, uh, whether you're using the, uh, the systems from, uh, from ProtonMail. Then there's a few other ones. I think StartMail has one as well, the Start Page Group or hosting your own. Hosting your own is the way I go. I manage a lot of email addresses. Hosting is the best thing for me. Uh, and so that is, uh, that is my number two point. Number one, use Nextcloud. Nextcloud is pretty much a replacement for most of those cloud services uh, that are collecting your data, harvesting your data. This is gonna give you a little bit more security. Now, the downside is as far as I know, and if somebody knows differently, please correct me. As far as I know, there's nowhere where you can just purchase a personal instance for Nextcloud. You'll see there's a buy button. And on the buy button, it's pretty much an enterprise offering type thing. Good for a business, um, but you know, Hey, 1,900 euros for 50 users per year. A little expensive for the typical family. Um, but uh, if you actually uh, want to, you can just download it. And you can just go ahead and um, pick up your own copy of this, install it on your new shared server. So here's the thing. With that shared server we just talked about and hosting your own emails, you can pick up your, your domain, you can attach it to your shared server, okay? Uh, attach it to your server or either your VPS or whatever, however you're doing it. Attach it to there with your own email addresses so you can give anybody in your family your own email address that's tied only to you. And then you can install Nextcloud on top of it because if you come to the download page, uh, there is a web installer. This will work on any cPanel account. Very easy to install. I have some videos about how to do this. Simply set this script up to run. It's going to install Nextcloud right on your server. So now on your server, you will have your own email addresses and you'll have a personal cloud that is end-to-end -end encrypted. So you as a family, can each family member can have their own separate cloud item. You can have your own place to store your music, which you can stream from your music onto your devices. You can store your files. You can store your photos. You can sync your phone. You can sync your contacts. And you can sync your calendar without using Google calendars or without using Google cal uh, contacts to sync all your contacts and give them to Google. You can do all of that through Nextcloud very simply on a shared server. It does get a little bit more complicated if you want to set up a uh, video conferencing uh, system or the Google Docs replacement called Code or Calibora. It gets a little bit more complicated if you want to set those up. Those will not go on a simple cPanel uh, shared server. Um, but if you w need to use those functions, you can get those set up too. Um, it's just, this is for the family stuff. And inside of that, you could have a shared family folder. So you guys, Hey, you took a photo or whatever else you guys could just simply click the thing in your control panel, click the button, share the file to your whole family. So that kind of takes care of some of those. So using Nextcloud, it replaces Dropbox. You can, by the way, upload something to the cloud, uh, to your Nextcloud account, click the link by, sh uh, share by link, copy the link email that to somebody, they can click right in the link, download the file. You can set an expiration date on the file, etc. It replaces Dropbox. Um, it replaces Google Calendar Sync. It replaces Google Contact Sync. It replaces syncing up your photos and things. So um, if I grab my phone and I set my phone up to manually or to automatically do this, anytime I snap a photo, I hit Wi-Fi, boom, sends the photo up to the cloud instant backup of anything on the phone. And I can back up any folder uh, customized on the phone to, to the, the Nextcloud uh, system. So that is the power of Nextcloud, is excellent, excellent system, end-to-end -end encrypted. You can host it on your own system. It's fairly easy to maintain. Um, there's a few little quirks with it, as new as software as it is, those are all very easy to resolve. 
Um, but of course, this is why you want to have that SSL so that you have the SSL ability to, to uh, uh, lock that into, into the system. So uh, with that being said, um, those are my top reasons uh, or the, the top ways to protect your privacy online utilizing online tools. So thanks for watching this video. If you'd like to help support this channel, you can check out switchtolinux.com forward slash support. That's going to give you all the ways to support the channel. Currently, I have uh, an Amazon affiliate links there on Amazon Associates. So if you ever shop on Amazon, use that link. It'll send a small portion uh, to help switch to Linux. There's also a PayPal link on that page. Um, and I do have a merchandise store where you can get some t-shirts, mouse pads, things like that. So you can check out shop.switchtolinux.com for that. And if you do use Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Tom M. So thanks for watching this video, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.